evening. <laughs> this is a nice problem to have. <laughs> Standing room only. I'm Vaughn White. I'm director of Multicultural Student Services here at Salisbury University. And uh, I want to give a warm welcome to everyone that's here, especially the students who've come out tonight to, um, to learn some additional information about slavery and many, many other topics. I think um, it's going to be a very exciting evening. And it's even that much more exciting when we have a lot of engaged folks who are very, very interested in the topic that's going to be presented this evening. Um, the Enlightened Perspective Lecture Series is one that we started many, many years ago through our department. Um, and in fact, the, the title was given by uh, a group of students who were uh, history buffs and who wanted to try to make a difference here at Salisbury University. We've made it a tradition to have at least a lecture each semester that's going to expose especially our new students that come to Salisbury to the format of having regular lectures and information shared with them outside of the classroom. So um, we feel that we've been pretty successful at that and I think tonight it's going to be one of our uh, um, banner evenings for uh, imparting some knowledge to our new students and for those of you who are enrolled in various classes here at Salisbury University. And I want to give a shout out for the, the professors that uh, gave you the information about uh, this particular lecture. So it's part of a series of uh, programs that we were having here at Salisbury University related to slavery and its legacy. But first I wanted to um, introduce a few people that without their help would not, uh, it would not be possible to do many of our programs. I want to make sure I have this completely correctly, correct? We have um, Valerie Randall Lee, who is our Assistant uh, uh, Vice President for Student Affairs um, and uh, Multicultural Student Services within Student Affairs. Um, Dr. Wallace Southern, who is the Associate VP of Student Affairs here at Salisbury University. Um, we have a contingent of students from Chesapeake College here this evening, and which, is, which is great. Welcome to Salisbury. We want you to make Salisbury your final destination for your four-year degree. So uh, you'll get a, a sample of, of what we have to offer here. So that's, that's really great. And all the fellow students here at, at SU that, uh, that we're, we are definitely um, glad to have. We also have our provost, Dr. Karen Olmsted, is here with us this evening. All right, okay. And um, a couple other people that you're going to meet at, uh, as we go along within the program. Um, at this time, Considering the events of the day, I'd like to have a moment of silence for uh, Representative Elijah Cummings, who passed away today. So if we can just take a moment of silence for uh, Congressman Cummings. Thank you. Thank you and amen. Now, as we get our program going, I'd like for you to please silence those uh, cell phones, those iPhones that we have. And uh, if you decide that you need to leave, we'd love to, for you to stay the whole time. Um, but um, if you decide, uh, please do that during a possible uh, break. We, we promise that we won't keep you the full two hours, but I know that topics can, uh, you know, can really go forward because of all the good information that's being shared. So um, we are, uh, if you would have that respect for our speaker um, this evening, I would truly, truly appreciate that. Now at this time, I'd like to uh, welcome to the stage Dr. Wallace Sutherland. He's the Associate Vice President of Student Affairs and the co-chair of the 1619-2019 400 Years of Resilience 
series here at Salisbury, and uh, he will give you an overview of the program. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I want to also acknowledge the co-chair of the series, Dr. April Logan. Please stand. She's the co-chair of the 400 Years of Resilience series. If there are any members here of the planning committee, please stand so we can acknowledge you for your efforts. Any members of the planning committee, stand or wave your hand. Thank you. We've had a number of academic and administrative departments that helped make the entire series this entire fall semester possible. And I just want to name them. And at the end, let's give all the sponsors a round of applause. Beacon, College of Health and Human Services, English Department, Social Justice, Equity and Teaching, Transformation, Faculty Learning Community, Fulton School of Liberal Arts, Henson School of Technology, History Department, Honors College, Institutional Equity and Inclusion Office, NAB Center, Purdue School of Business, President's Office, Provost Office, School of Social Work, Seagull Century, Seidel School of Education, the Student Activity Fee, Student Affairs Division, and SU Libraries. Let's give all of our co-sponsors a round of applause. So this event is situated in a larger series of events that are occurring on a university's campus for the entire rest of the fall semester. So 400 years ago, this past August, began the, the horrific institution of slavery here in the British colonial America with the landing of 20 and odd enslaved Africans uh, who landed in Port Comfort, Virginia. And so we're spending this semester reflecting, remembering, having conversations, and celebrating the resilience of descendants of enslaved Africans. And what we are striving for this semester is to create a series of conversations, some of which may very well be uncomfortable, but it is very necessary and essential that the entire university Eastern Shore community engaged in these conversations so that we can better understand the institution and history of slavery, the lasting effects of slavery, and even the impact of slavery on the relationships that we have today. Ideally, we need to move intentionally toward reconciliation, toward healing, and toward forgiveness. So young people, we are challenging you and we are asking you, and not just the young people, but the faculty, the staff, the employees, the educators, and so many other individuals, ask questions about how do we get to where we are today? What's been the impact of slavery on who we are as individuals, on the character of our nation? Ask questions about how do we begin to move toward forgiving each other? Ask questions about how do we make sure that nothing like this ever happened again? Ask questions about how do we stop slavery wherever it might be existing anywhere today? So thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much for your engagement. And I am confident that you will have a great evening. And we hope you will participate in other events for the rest of the semester. Look out for the reminders that will be coming through on your university um, email accounts. If you're interested, you can always speak to any of us at the end of the program. Again, thank you very much. Good evening. I have the awesome privilege this evening to introduce our lecturer for uh, this evening. Ms. Mary Elliott is the curator of the American Slavery at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC. She has co-curated the museum's Slavery and Freedom inaugural exhibition. Ms. Elliott is a graduate of Howard University and the Catholic University of American Columbus School of Law. She has helped produce many exhibits and public programs in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. 
Ms. Elliott has lectured on topics in slavery and freedom, community engagement, material culture, and exhibition development. She has been interviewed on several media outlets to include CBS 60 Minutes, C-SPAN, Slate, BBC, NPR, and PBS. Most recently, she has curated and co-wrote the special section of the acclaimed New York Times featured publication series entitled The 1619 Project. Ms. Elliott comes to Salisbury University with over 20 years of experience in researching and presenting African American history and culture. Please help me welcome to Salisbury University, Ms. Mary Elliott. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna hold this microphone. It's easier that way. Good evening, everyone. So, um, as you heard, my name is Mary Elliott, and thank you for that very kind introduction, Mr. Potter. I was listening and I was like, who's that person? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm a I am a very humble person, so to see my picture splashed all over campus kind of took me back a little bit. <laughs> so I'm really excited to be here with you all this evening. Thank you to Mr. Potter and Mr. White for inviting me to be part of this occasion and part of this speaker series. My conversation tonight will be on the institutionalization of slavery and its legacy in the United States. So I thought about what are the different ways that we can think about this. It includes looking at the laws. It includes looking at custom and practices. It includes thinking about the church in addition to government organizations. The other way of looking at this is to also help people to see themselves in this history. At the National Museum of African American History and Culture, we say that we look at the American story through the African American lens. So what does that mean? Our museum is not the black museum for the black people. Our museum is for everyone. This is a shared history. So what I tell everyone is when you come into the museum, I don't know how many of you all have been thus far, but when you go into the museum, for example, in the slavery section, we don't just look at enslaved Africans and the planter elite class. We look at enslaved Africans. We look at free people of color. We look at Native Americans. We look at poor whites. We look at yeoman farm, white farmers, as well as the planter elite. Everyone is part of building this nation. And so we have to include everyone's voice in this history. We look at this as a human story. And we also look at the juxtaposition of profit and power to the human cost. We look at how Africans in the world and African Americans in the nation shaped the landscape and were shaped by the landscape. I go through my litany, it's very important that socially, politically, economically, culturally, demographically, intellectually, and even spiritually. And we look at human suffering, but we also look at the power of the human spirit, and that goes across the board. Resistance, resilience, and survival. It's very important that we think of all of these things as we go through this history. So this is the National Museum of African American History and Culture built in 2016 is when we opened. We've had over 7 million visitors. We have a cross section of people who come interracially, interracial, intergenerational, international from all over the world. This is a vista of the history galleries. I have this up here because we're talking about the institutionalization of slavery and its legacy in the United States. Let me point out something. You see on the bottom level, that's the Slavery and Freedom Exhibition. But if you look up top, there is the rail car. This is the section on segregation. Slavery and Freedom goes from mid 15th century all the way through to Reconstruction 1877. Segregation picks up at the tail end of, of Reconstruction and goes all the way through the modern civil rights era. You'll see right next to that segregated rail car is a guard tower from Angola prison. Now, I was speaking with someone earlier today and we talked about this recent article in the Washington Post about two of the most successful slave dealers during the period of the antebellum period, Isaac Franklin and John Armfield. Isaac Franklin took his profit, turned it into power and bought eight plantations, including several in Louisiana. Now think about this, on the back side of the slave cabin, you see directly across from the Tower of Cotton. Slavery, we tell the story of when it came to a close. Emancipation Proclamation, end of the Civil War, 13th Amendment. The end of slavery, unless you commit a crime. 
13th Amendment, the end of slavery unless you commit a crime. 14th Amendment, grant citizenship. 15th Amendment, the right to vote. Picture you have African Americans who have to get on with their lives after being enslaved all those years. You either sign a sharecropper contract and you're back in those same fields and you're living in those same slave cabins, but now you have a contract. It's employer and employee. But you're basically still existing as if you were enslaved. Or you try and get on with your life. Now, think about those planter class who say, wait a minute, I've lost all my profit, my free labor. The first laws that go on the books are the vagrancy laws. So if you're walking around trying to get on with your life and someone accuses you of being a vagrant, then you are picked up and placed in the prison system and you are part of the convict lease labor system. That guard tower is from Angola prison. Angola prison allows us to tell the story about the convict lease labor system. You are now in the prison system and your labor is leased out to those same plant, former plantation owners or still plantation owners to labor in those fields again as free labor. Angola Prison sits on the site of Angola Plantation. Angola Plantation was owned by Isaac Franklin. So you go from slavery to the convict lease labor system. Angola Prison is one of the worst prisons in the United States. We have a prison cell in our community gallery and that lets us talk about the prison industrial complex today. So none of this history is told in a vacuum. When we start the Slavery and Freedom Exhibition, we had to anticipate questions people would ask. And so some of those questions include, well, wait a minute, I thought slavery existed in the world already. So it can't be that bad because it was already going on, even in Africa. But here's the difference. Slavery in the continent was usually based on warfare. If you owe debt to avoid being enslaved yourself, you see Queen Nzinga here, Queen Nzinga, was a leader along the Western African coastline. She was strategic, aligned with the Dutch, the Portuguese, and the Catholic Church, all to avoid her own people from being enslaved. She harbored fugitives who were fleeing from the slave catchers. Ultimately, the Dutch, the Portuguese, and the Catholic Church all turned against her. You could be accused of a crime and placed in the slave trade as well. Or it was simply to make profit. The other thing is to note that this was a temporary status in many cases, and also you had more autonomy. Your children didn't inherit your status. You could move up in society. You could even earn the respect of society but still be considered enslaved. The difference is when the transatlantic slave trade took hold, it was commercialized, it was racialized, and the child inherited the status of the mother. So it became chattel slavery. Thinking about institutionalization of slavery, we look at the church and we look at the crown. So here you have Pope Nicholas V who divided the world in 1494 and designated that Portugal would have the opportunity to engage in trade along the Western African coastline and Spain would take control of all the colonies in the New World. What's really significant about that too is that Spain had a contract, it's called the Asiento. And so we hear about all of these European nation states that engaged in the trade. This was a business. And so these nation states fought over not only colonizing the New World, but also the opportunity to supply human capital to the New World, to the New World colonies, as well as control the trade on the West African coastline. So you had the Dutch, the Portuguese, the French, the British, all fighting over that contract. Then you have the British crown that minted this token, the guinea coin, and it's stamped with the elephant and castle. That showed that the British were engaged in, they sanctioned the trade in gold and in people, enslaved African men, women, and children. And right next to that, we have a Barbados penny. It's a penny, a token that was used on the plantations, and you'll note the bust of an African man, and underneath I, it says, I serve. Well, why does that even matter? Today, the conversation is about Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill. And at the end of the day, it sends a message. Here, the message was slavery was okay. So we look at the church, we look at these nation states, but also look at regulating the trade. So you actually had regulations in place dictating how to pack a slave ship. Governments controlled the trade. This image here by J.M. Forrester shows 
a depiction of a historic case about the Zong. The Zong was a slave ship that the enslavers, in order to make money, they threw many of their human cargo overboard and then claimed the insurance money. This case was very important because it went towards trying to prove how horrific slavery was so that abolitionists could actually abolish the slave trade amongst the British. So we think about institutionalization. How are things put in place? You just heard about 1619. 1619, you have John Rolfe writing to the Virginia Company of London talking about 20 and odd Negroes were forced into what is known as Point Comfort, Virginia. And this is part of, you see at the top, part of what was taken out of the letter that he wrote to the Virginia Company. Why is this important? Because it documents all that's going on in what becomes the United States. This is, is in British colonial North America. We know that there were enslaved and free, free people already in North America at the time, particularly in Spanish colonial North America. And then you see here where we have the case of John Punch in the 1640s. John Punch is listed as a servant who ran away with two other servants. What's important about that case is, while oftentimes we focus on the fact that when they were captured, the two other servants he was with, who were of European descent, gained additional years on their indenture, while John Punch was named enslaved for life. But what I want people to note is that also, this man of African descent ran away with two men of European descent. It was a much more fluid society, but as you start to see the laws start to lock in place, who is white, who is black, who is free, who is enslaved? And then we see the laws about children. The status of the children follows the status of the mother. And so you start to see not only this, this power, political power, geopolitical power, but economic power. So you're breeding the next generation of enslaved people of African descent to do the work in the fields, to clear the land, to ultimately cultivate that profit and power. And then we have the case of Anthony Johnson. Anthony Johnson, a man who was a servant who purchased his freedom. He owned land. He even owned an enslaved person he went to court to claim who had run away. He ultimately passed on his land to his children. But the state of Virginia, or the Virginia colony, said, Posthumously, Anthony Johnson was a black man, therefore he was an alien, therefore he's not a citizen, therefore he could not bequeath his land to his children. And so they took the land and gave it to a person of European descent. We think about the church, and I included this because in Maryland, Maryland very much was a Catholic site. And so you think of Maryland and the Catholic church and the land that some of that land ultimately became Washington, D.C., but also the church supporting the development of Georgetown University and the owning of 272 enslaved people and ultimately selling them to Louisiana. These records are records that they had to file also with the Vatican. And so institutionalization, these constant development of records and laws and edicts to control a whole population of people of African descent to generate profit and therefore power and to create opportunities. When we think about the institutionalization and the legacies, think about the legacy of those who attended Georgetown and those who actually were sent away further south. Additionally, we perfected these laws. So you have sites like Barbados, where you have slave-owning families who perfect these laws down in the Caribbean and extend their enterprise of slavery and their opportunity for wealth. And they go into what becomes colonial South Carolina. At this point, their system of slavery is already locked in place. And they're able to, again, as I said, extend their enterprise of slavery. So again, we see how this is institutionalized. These laws are locking race and class in place and confirming the opportunity for profit. Now, some of these laws, and I'm taking us outside of the United States right now, some of these laws and the institutionalization, it's not just about labor and profit. You also see where some of these laws dictate in terms of the brutality of slavery. And so you have a slave code that comes out from the Danish that dictates that you can split someone's nose, cut off someone's ear, cut off their foot. And you have enslaved people who ultimately revolt against these laws. 
because of the brutality of slavery. There was a group of enslaved African men, women, and children who fled into the mountains. They killed several slaveholders, and they remained there for quite a long time. And ultimately, the Danish and some Maroon community members, Maroons are those who had run away and moved into other sites in other um, jurisdictions in the Caribbean, it formerly enslaved, went in and pulled those people out from the woods. But the fact is that people fought against this system of brutality. And then you have sites like Louisiana, where you have this institutionalization in the code noir. Again, this is a system that dictates status based on class and race. And it's really locking in that system of power and profit at a human cost. So that gets us to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution all of these laws that are developed and where we don't see slavery actually named in the Constitution or in the Declaration of Independence, it's all surrounded on slavery. This platform here, we have the images of Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Banneker, Phyllis Wheatley, Mum Bett, they're in the back, and Toussaint Louverture. This is a feature in our exhibition where we have these voices of freedom. You have Thomas Jefferson, who actually drafted the Declaration of Independence, a first draft that was thrown out, where he calls out the king, King George III, and says, here you are. You got us into this system of slavery. You had us institute slavery in the colonies. And then you asked that the enslaved turn against the colonists to fight for the British as we fight for our freedom. That actually was taken out of that first draft, and we have what is now the Declaration of Independence. But it's still this conversation of slavery that was taking place at the time. And then we have the Three-Fifths Compromise. Again, you don't hear the word slavery, see the word slavery in these documents, but the Three-Fifths Compromise. Many African Americans think of the Three-Fifths Compromise as, well, we were only seen as three-fifths of a person. But when you think about it, again, profit and power, that three-fifths add up. So when you have the domestic slave trade after the 1808 end of our involvement in the international slave trade, we're no longer importing people in directly from Africa, but we're still relying on slavery to generate profit. Who's going to cultivate the land that we now acquire after 1803? We double in size with the Louisiana Purchase. So we have the domestic slave trade at least a million people are moved down south to generate more profit in those cotton fields. But what does that mean? The three-fifths clause provides an opportunity for the slaveholding class to have even more power. When you add up those three-fifths, it dictates the number of seats in Congress. During all of this time, we'd be remiss if we thought about simply the human suffering and not about the power of the human spirit. So there are many African Americans who bring their voices to the public arena and fight against this system of slavery. You have Mum Bet in the lower corner who fought against her enslavement during the revolutionary period. She ultimately won her case and gained her freedom. And it ultimately had an impact dictating on Massachusetts doing gradual emancipation. But then you also have institutions like the church and black leaders like Richard Allen Mother Bethel AME Church in Philadelphia and the leadership of Richard Allen who founded the African Methodist Episcopal um, denomination who bring their voice to the streets and to the courthouses to fight against this system of slavery. This is our founding of America wall in the museum. And so while we look at the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, we also look at Andrew Jackson and the Indian removal moving Native Americans further west so that they can, the colonists, or so that people in the US can claim land and spread slavery further west and again guarantee more profit and therefore power. But we also look at 1803, Louisiana Purchase, 1808, end of our involvement in the international slave trade, 1820 Compromise, 1850 Compromise, and we look at the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Remember I said everyone's story is in this. And so when we look at the institutionalization of slavery and its legacies, one of the things that's important is, again, I said, this is not the black museum for black people, and this is not just our history. It's everyone's. So when we think about the coming of the Civil War, how often do people think about a group called the Free Soilers? The Free Soilers were a group of 
poor whites and yeoman white farmers. They said, okay, so wait a minute, you're doubling the nation in size and you're asking whether we want the spread of slavery, yet the benefit is going to the planter elite. I'm a yeoman white farmer. I'm not extended the opportunity to expand my enterprise. I'm a poor white person. I have to compete against free labor. And so they had an economic interest in what happened with the nation. But so often we don't hear those stories. It's imperative that we all engage in conversation about how we came into being and how this nation developed and the impact on all of us. So as we go towards the Civil War, you see cases like the Dred Scott decision, where Dred Scott, an enslaved man, was carried into a territory that um, he saw as a promise for freedom. He sued for his freedom, and the Supreme Court said that in fact, he was not a citizen. And so he was not guaranteed his freedom. He was carried into that free state and still considered to be enslaved. And then you have the fugitive slave laws. The fugitive slave laws dictated that anyone in the North or in other parts where there were free states had to make sure that anyone who fled to their freedom in those states had to be turned in and returned back to the enslavers as property. So quite often we hear that the Civil War was not about slavery. But in the secession documents of South Carolina, you'll find that slavery is mentioned almost 18 times, I believe. The Fugitive Slave Act is at the heart of that because people saw enslaved people as property and it actually says in the secession documents that the North was not following through with the laws. And so Abraham Lincoln was elected in November 1860 and in South Carolina they seceded in December of 1860. Finally we come to the Emancipation Proclamation. Now we often talk about the Emancip Emancipation Proclamation and it was not um, a perfected freedom. It gave freedom to those states that were part of the Confederacy. It gave freedom to the enslaved in those states. It wasn't until the 13th Amendment that the United States ended slavery. And again, remember, it was with the caveat that unless you commit a crime. The 13th Amendment ends slavery unless you commit a crime. The 14th Amendment guarantees citizenship. And the 15th Amendment guarantees the right to vote. We get into the Reconstruction period and you see where people fight to hold on to that right to vote. People fight to build communities. People fight to survive. There are groups like the Loyalist Leagues who march through the streets carrying guns, banging drums, and forcing their right to vote, and they're met with these groups called the Red Shirts, which ultimately are considered the Klan. And so you have these clashes between some white Americans and, some, and many African Americans fighting to enforce that right to vote. Ultimately, there are black codes that are put in place to restrict the freedoms of the newly freed African Americans. In 1876, there's a compromise and Rutherford B. Hayes is elected into office and the federal troops are pulled out of the South and everything changes. You have the case of Plessy v. Ferguson where you see that it's unequal conditions for people of color. Segregation and the Jim Crow laws are all in place. My own family were involved in what is considered the Loyalist Leagues in Mississippi. They fought at a church in Octibaha County, Mississippi. It's documented in the newspapers and it's documented in a book called The Historical Sketches of Octibaha County, written with a very unapologetic voice. These niggers marched through the streets carrying drums and guns, enforcing their right to vote. But we killed some, we stuffed the ballot boxes, we ran some of these carpetbaggers out of town. It's documented. And this institutionalization of slavery and this system of discrimination and hostility and unequal 
went on for quite some time, and yes, there are still legacies of that, but then we have moments like Brown versus Board of Education, where we fought against it and we were able to make changes. We have the Civil Rights Act, where people work together to make changes, to ensure that African Americans could still enforce their right to vote, that African Americans had some equality as with any other citizen. But then you come to the 80s and you have the disparate drug laws, the difference between crack cocaine and powdered cocaine. And you have a whole system of African Americans locked away. And you think about even today with the marijuana laws. And you have prisons filled with black people. But now marijuana is legal and people can profit from it. When you go to jail, you do not have the right to vote when you come out. These are some of the legacies of slavery. So we look at today people fighting to enforce the law. I use these images and I say fighting to enforce the law because what we're fighting for is the protection of our lives. To say that we are all due the right to live free without fear of endangerment, particularly from our own police system. Or with the opportunity to go to court and argue your case, due process. And so it's important that we look at all of these legacies of slavery, and I've only shown you a few, and it's important to understand this sweep of history. While it can be very heavy, what I want to point out to you is one of the things that I love about my job. So I look out in this audience and I see a mixed audience, interracial, intergenerational, from I'm sure many parts of the world. I had the honor of collecting the slave cabin for our exhibition. When we collected the cabin, the community came out every day for a week. When I say the community, I mean the descendant community. When I say descendants, I don't just mean descendants of the enslaved. It's the descendants of the enslaving family as well. They came out every day for a week and we had direct conversations about this history. It's a hard history, but they own it together. Just up the road in Soderley, Maryland, it's the same case with in Hollywood, Maryland, Soderley Plantation. It's the same thing. We engage in community conversation. It's not easy, as it was mentioned earlier, but one of the greatest things that I've experienced is the opportunity to sit down with a cross-section of people, different races, different ages, and discuss what does all of this mean? What's the point of knowing the history if you can't grow from it, right? And so the most important thing I could leave you with is I've only shown you a few slides tonight. I've discussed some of this history and how slavery was institutionalized and how some of that still rests with us today. I haven't even dived deep into what rests with us today because it's a lot more. But the most important thing is that we reflect on this history and think about where we came from, where we are, and where we want to be. Not where we have yet to go, but where we want to be. And the only way you can do it is to think about this history. So again, you see this vista of the history galleries in the Slavery and Freedom Exhibition in the Segregation Gallery, and we have a changing America. We don't end the story on President Obama, but we do talk about him because we know there's still more work to do. So we start with that mid 15th century and a world where people didn't call themselves Africans or Europeans. They called themselves Mende or Igbo or Yoruban. French or Spanish or Dutch. And then we all became enslaved to a system of slavery. And so it's incumbent upon us to make changes now. So it's been my pleasure to give this presentation and I hope you all um, enjoyed it and have plenty of questions and I definitely hope you come and visit the museum, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, I just wanted to know if you would speak a little bit about um, the 13th and 14th and the 15th Amendment and the years. Oh, thank oh, you. <laughs> um, oh gosh, I've got to remember all the exact years. Um, 13th Amendment is, um, I think it goes into place around December 1865. 14th Amendment, um, I want to say it's around 1867, and 15th Amendment, where is my professor who, eight, and 15th Amendment is around that same time. Yeah, and then the Klan comes into play, um, 1868, so all of this is going on as there's this battle, b battle, really one could say about how we're going to identify as a nation that's really a nation that's supposed to be based on freedom, right? And so the world changed for everybody. And you have different states that put in place these black codes, but then you have people fighting against all of that. And you have the federal troops coming in, they're doing those sharecropper contracts and trying to enforce um, this new form of you know, government and making sure that people are enabled to live in their free status. But again, like I said, there is that compromise. We see these compromises from the three-fifths compromise to now you have this compromise, which is um, the election in 1876, again, where Rutherford B. Hayes is elected and the federal troops are pulled out. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I did. I was wondering what that, what that time frame was. And, you know, recently, I don't know where it was. I just learned about the, um, you know, that the vacancy was. That yeah. You had no choice. You could leave. If you left, you were either going to prison or you're going back to right back to where you came from. Yeah. Uh, so it was a moot point to say that you were free, you were not free. Right. Well, so one of the things that happened with my own family is they were planning to leave to go to Indian Territory, which ultimately became Oklahoma. But the planter class did not want to lose that free labor. And so that was a big issue in and of itself, and then that constant fight to enforce their right to vote. So you have the Freedmen's Bureau that's in place for a short period, but again, it's a very volatile time. But I have to be clear that it was also an opportunity, a time where African Americans were seizing the opportunity to get educated, to build churches, to create their own community institutions, to become entrepreneurs. So there was a lot of activity going on for African Americans who were creating their own successes, but it was against this backdrop of a lot of volatility. So that's very important, that reconstruction era, and we need to know more about it, to talk more about it, because it tells us a lot about where we are right now. Mm -hmm. I think the formation of those things is what inflamed those other laws coming because they could say, whoa, there's power building. Yeah, there's power building, and we have to do what we can to stop that power from building. Yes, and I'll, I'll go to the next question, but I do have to point out just what you said, all of these elected officials, African-American elected officials during that period, and so that fallout too, there was a lot of fallout from that as well, so very important. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, my Hi. question was about when you were saying that Slavery was waste wise when people were coming to America. But what I know is that it wasn't waste wise until the Bacon Rebellion. Because before the Bacon Rebellion, most of they were enslaving non Christians. So slaves were actually getting baptized to free themselves from slavery. So my, um, my question is what is your opinion on the Bacon Rebellion and how did it? transpired to waste life safely with the um, program of ind indigenous students to being um, going to waste life safely. Well, actually, um, I'd have to differ with you on that. The Catholic Church actually, when the Portuguese started going along that Western African coastline in the mid 1400s, there were people of African descent and even Native Americans in the New World by the 1490s who were converted to Christianity, right? But the Catholic Church said just because people of African descent are converted to, the, to Christianity does not mean that they are no longer enslaved. So you have this select group, they're converted to Christianity, but they are still held in bondage. So while it's not 
while there's no legislation in Virginia about slavery, a specific legislation like in Massachusetts, which passes the first laws enacting slavery. That's why we say look at custom, look at case law, look at legislation. In Virginia, custom, look at the practice. So 1619, when the 20 and odd Negroes were brought into Point Comfort, where we talk about indentured servitude, indentured servitude involved a contract. The people who pirated that Portuguese ship, they were British, and they pirated the Sao João Batista, which was on its way to Mexico to sell enslaved African men, women, and children into slavery in Mexico. When that ship was pirated, what was known is that these people were of value. They were a commodity. They were worth something. And so by the time they get to Point Comfort, there's a transaction that takes place. They were bought for victuals. So they were bought and sold. Their indenture contract was not bought. They were bought. They did not have a contract in place. And in that moment, they were enslaved. They were sold as human commodities. And so while there may not have been a law on the books, it still is custom. It's case law, as in the case of John Punch, where he is actually called a Negro enslaved for life. And Anthony Johnson, a free man who in his death, his freedom was still taken away from him, even in death. And so when we talk about institutionalizing slavery, the institutionalization, you can't just go by, it's the legislation, it's all of these practices. And the Catholic Church during the early period said, regardless of whether these enslaved African men, women, or children were Christian, were um, actually baptized, they were still going to be held in bondage. When Georgetown got rid of their slaves to Louisiana, was it for economic reasons? Did they need the money? Or was it to clear their name as being slaveholders? Oh, no, it was for economic reasons. Mm hmm Yeah, and I think they still had some enslaved people. I'm not sure. I have to check on that. But it was for um, economic reasons. Yeah. Thank you. Mm hmm Hi, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Um, so my question is, um, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I think you were talking about shareholding. So like the enslavement was over, but it was kind of like a neo-slavery. It was like sharecropping, I think is what it was. Um, so my question is, could you maybe compare it to today's tenant farming? Is there like a correlation with that? Um, I would think so. During the period, during that reconstruction period, you had a contract, you bought things on credit, you hoped that you got paid at the end of the season so that you wouldn't end up in debt. Um, and usually people ended up in debt, and so you worked all that land, and you would have to keep working that land, right? Even after laws passed and the sharecropping system or that system during that period, you know, was supposedly coming to an end. At the end of the day, there were people who were still during Jim Crow picked up off the street and placed on plantation sites. It's called peonage, right? And so this was a system that went on and oftentimes people were ashamed and didn't talk about it. There was an article in the Washington Post where a gentleman talked about his having been placed in peonage. And there are letters that are held at the National Archives where people wrote about their being pulled off the streets and placed on these plantation sites. Um, I, I can't say I know enough about today's tenant farming system that I could do the comparison, but I would say that it's, it's, it's pretty much the same. Yeah. Yeah. There are, um, there are recent cases of people who, um, very heartbreaking, say that they did not know that things had changed and they're in these very rural areas. And it's unbelievable, but they do exist. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I have a question more about sort of your role in the museum now. Uh, because obviously you have a background in history, but a lot of what you do is related to historical memory in terms of working with the public. And so in your experience, how do you navigate 
working with the public where you know they come with a lifetime of perhaps uh, misassumptions or frankly just miseducation right I mean you we've all seen old American history books where slavery is literally described as quote the first form of social security it's literally in certain state history books mm -hmm. so if you have people in the public with that kind of background and they engage the museum have you ever had this sort of situation where, where you've had to really try to you know get at someone's lifetime of programming and sort of yeah and sort of work on deprogramming them so to speak i get it all the time yeah. <laughs> but, but, mm -hmm. but no I'm, I'm gonna let you know um i get it all the time but i just had a conversation that um i talked about the diverse group of people that i talk to regularly and everyone has a story and everyone has their truth Someone might look at me and say, well, you're an African-American woman. Why should you care about telling everyone's story? This is the African-American Museum. But there's a reason why I emphasize that we talk about enslaved African, free people of color, Native American, poor white, yeoman white farmer, and planter elite. Because you have to be able to see yourself in this story. And the fact is, there are many black people who come to the museum who have certain notions of what this story is. And they say, I didn't know this. And there are plenty of white people who come to the museum who know the story a certain way. And they see these nuances. A black man in Pennsylvania who was free and owned land could vote until the 1830s. But a white man who was poor, who didn't own land, could not. And people say, I didn't know that. Because there's this sense of whiteness and blackness but it's all institutionalized. It's all created for power. At the heart of it is power. And so we have to see where do we fit into that? And also how do we change it? And so for me, I meet people all the time and I wanna hear their stories. I wanna hear, well, what did you learn about this? How did you learn this? And I also wanna see their family artifacts and I want us to sit around and talk about it. We had a group, that same group down on Edisto Island where we met with white residents and black residents, um, descendants of the enslaved and descendants of the slaveholding family. One of the women whose um, family was one of the largest slaveholding families her father was a doctor and he serviced all of the community down there, black and white, right? And so one of the things that she found out as we were doing these oral histories with some of the older African-American residents, um, they talked about when children were born and these nurses would come in from Charleston into Edisto Island and they would document the children that were born. And the nurses would stay down for a week and they were very um, dismissive, like, well, what's the baby's name? And they'd just write down whatever. And then they go back a week later and put these records away. And what this woman didn't know, because she thought it was the same experience for everyone, and, and these African-American residents appreciated this woman's father, but what this woman did not know is that many of the children who were documented had to apply as adults for new IDs and social security numbers because their records were not correct the way they were documented because it was so dismissive about their existence and who they were and what their names were and who their mother was. And so it was really telling to be in that conversation and it was heartbreaking for her because she said, I didn't know this was your experience, right? And they appreciated her realization of what they went through but they also talked about how they appreciated her father serving as um, an advocate for them in many cases as well. So for me, it's just a matter of, I appreciate being able to facilitate conversation and get people to think about this history. You're right, it's the memory piece. Um, I met with the descendants of the slaveholding family who owned the site where we got the slave cabin, and I asked these two gentlemen, very frankly, they invited us to dinner, and it was myself and a colleague, both black, and um, I asked them what was it like for them to inherit this legacy of slavery, and what was it like for them to go from segregation to integration. And while they might have said things I didn't want to hear, I, I wanted to hear what they, what they had to say. And so I think I can't emphasize it enough that, yeah, it's uncomfortable conversation, but have the conversation. You don't have to agree with everything. There should be some ground rules that you're not offending someone in, in an intentional manner, but that you're at least sharing your stories, right? 
so that we can learn from each other. I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Hello. Very glad to meet you and have you here. Thank you. Campus. It's really a, a real pleasure. Uh, just a tiny bit of, um, of context for this question. Uh, I'm a musician, professional singer. Uh, for a number of years, I've had um, the great privilege of going into the prison systems in Ohio uh, to work on uh, some music projects. And uh, we're sitting back here having this uh, conversation. I know for, for me, you know, as a musician, we walk in a very sort of dreamy, hopeful, we'll sing songs and everything's gonna be better. Uh, way through life, and uh, but I'm, I'm, my mind is, uh, you know, boggled every single time that I go uh, a couple times a year for probably 25 years now, and of, of this sea of, of black people, and so we, I would love for you to speak to um, the laws, uh, you touched on that, the laws that led to, to that. The laws that led to that led to the the numbers of, of incarcerated. Oh. Hmm. Oh well, I I actually stay focused on slavery and freedom, but for me, I knew about the laws. Like um, you came out of the civil rights laws, um, the Civil Rights Act being passed. But I grew up in the '80s, so I knew about um, Reagan and the drug laws. So that's the reason why I could pull from that. But if you ask me specific laws, I'd probably tell you to speak to one of my colleagues who they are more contemporary, period. But I can tell you from my own experience looking at laws like um, the drug laws, particularly the cocaine laws, um, how they dealt with powder cocaine versus rock cocaine. And so more than likely there are African Americans who would use crack versus someone who's not black that would use the powder cocaine. And the disparity in the, um, in the um, sentencing. And so that was very important, right? Um, the other thing, even though it's not law, I look at the disparity in terms of economic disparities when it comes to gentrification. And so opportunities for people to get any type of funding to purchase a home, or even when you think about the period where there was a lot of redlining, and there still is, because you just had, you know, most recently Bank of America involved with, um, you know, some of the activities that went on that led towards all of this gentrification as well. So that's, I think, the most I could talk about it in some kind of informed way, yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope I hope that answered your question. There's the gentleman who asked me the question about memory. There's a woman who I met down on Edisto Island, and she shared a story about a woman who was married. She was free with her child and her husband, and her husband died. And she shared with me, but there was this very kind woman. And when this black woman's husband died and she and her daughter were free, but she couldn't handle economically, she couldn't exist on her own, she said that a woman, a white woman, enslaved this woman and her daughter. And she said, wasn't that really kind of her? She enslaved them so they could survive. Those are some of the things that I hear. Yeah. And so just to make it plain, I just turned to her and I said, but the fact is they were enslaved. And if you say it enough times for someone to realize, understand what you're saying. The fact is they were enslaved. And she paused for a moment and thought about that. And so people will say, you know, they think that they're coming from a, a, a kind place. They don't have bad intentions. But we're all kind of being reprogrammed from the traditional narrative and how we think about this history, right? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, first of all, I went to the museum about a month ago. I want to just say that it was an awesome and exhausting day. Yes. So I recommend it very highly. Thank you. But as far as my question goes, um, people often talk about um, reparations. I was wondering if you could imagine or envision something like a uh, South African style truth and reconciliation commission in this, co this country, where we kind of admit what is done in a way that's very public, in a way that's not been done before. So um, the museum doesn't have a. Um a statement, an official statement on reparations. So I'm going to speak for myself. But I think there are two things that are important. Um, I don't think we give the public enough credit for wrestling with this history and reflecting on it and talking about it. That's why you keep hearing me repeat that. The example of 
how I don't think we give the public enough credit. When this museum opened, we've been open since 2016, and you heard me say we've had seven million visitors. 40% of our visitors are white. And then when that 1619 New York Times project came out, they've sold out of three printings. These are, folks are buying this stuff, reading this stuff, wanting to engage with it, wrestling with it, trying to figure out where do I fall on this? What do I think about this? But the point is they're confronting it. And so I think that's very important. I, I know with um, Bill Clinton's administration, they tried to do the, um, the race commission. And I think it's incumbent upon us, whether it's in our individual communities, whether it's on university campuses, that we facilitate these conversations to try and get us to the next level. And so this speaker series entitled the Enlightened Speaker Series is really important because it helps us. It's not just thoughtful, it's thought provoking. So helping us think through not only, okay, here's the history, here's what happened. How do we want to define ourselves as a nation? but also to think about how do we get to that point. So I, you know, that would be my response. In your opinion, how Thanks. do we best go about making this history common knowledge? So I worked with the um, Reginald Lewis Museum on their grant writing, and one of the things that I think they did that was really brilliant was working with the state of Maryland to try and get this history into the curriculum. Um, there's been the traditional narrative, and there's a book title and a quote from an African-American man, um, the half that's never been told. And so this is like that. But you hear me say that you have to include everyone, because this is my opinion. If we just talk about this history as just African-American history, then it allows people to say, well, it, it has nothing to do with me. This has everything to do with all of us. And so we have to include this history where we don't dismiss Native American, poor white, young and white farmer. What, what happened with enslaved people of African descent dictated the privileges that someone else got, or even the limits of their um, being free and white. We have to understand that because economically, your status was dictated as well. If you were poor, if you were a young and white farmer, there were still some limits on your freedom too. And so we don't talk about that and how this impacts all of us even today, even as we're standing in a public university and this big economic gap where people can't afford to go to college. This is, it's important that we reflect on this to think about how we can not just raise one ship, but all the ships. And so, um, you know, I think that one of the ways that we do that is to engage in conversation, but not just, um, I hate to say this, contemplating our navel, but thinking about real ways to try and make change. <laughs> and then carrying that to our um, elected officials and community organizations. Um, there was a case, um, I, was, I thought about this, in a jurisdiction where I do some community engagement work, and there's a black woman who is very well revered, and she raised many of the families in that community. She did the cooking, she did the cleaning, she raised the children. Um, when her car broke down, one of those children called her on her birthday, asked her how she was doing. They said, you know what? You go and you tell the dealer what car you want, and I'm gonna buy that for you. Right? You can already tell this woman, she's black, and, and the young man who called her, he's white, and he's up from a family of means. But this whole community, they all talked about this woman. We love her. I'm not going to say her name. And then they said, what are we going to do when she passes away? And what I thought to myself was, we can talk about reparations in many different forms, but here's this woman who if only she had been engaged to learn about how to build a business so she could train the next generation so they could be economically empowered, so they could send their kids to school, so they could also be entrepreneurs, but still maintain this, this tradition of service, if you want to call it that, but still they had economic empowerment. It would have been that simple, easier than buying her a car. Right? So those are the things that I think about, personally, that I think about. 
I have two things. One, you mentioned affordable housing, and right here in our own community, the local leader of Habitat for Humanity made some comment recently. I'm talking about within the last 30 days about the lack of affordable housing in our own community right here at home. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was the New York Times 1619 project. Mm -hmm. I listened to the radio a lot during the day. I'm one of those uh, retiree types that have nothing to do. Um, and you can turn on about three radios and I can hear you know, all the way through the house and not stay in one spot. And I kept hearing about this thing. And I finally decided I should go out and try to find it. I couldn't figure out what it was. Was it a newspaper art series? Was it a book? Sometimes it sounded like a hardback publication. I went to the bookstore and I said, I'm looking for this thing and this is a title I'm hearing. I have not seen that thing yet. Is it a book? Is it? It's a. Um, what is it? It is a. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull it up for you. I don't know if you have the internet in here. Yeah. So um, the 1619 project is a project that came about where um, colleagues at the Smithsonian and the gentleman who oversees the New York Times Magazine, they wanted to do a project together. And there was a young woman who's a MacArthur Genius Grant recipient. Her name is Nicole Hannah Jones, and she won um, this this grant based on her writing on um, on um, inequality in education, and so she knew that 16, the year 1619, the commemoration of the arrival of the enslaved 20 and odd people of African descent who were forced into um, the British colonies. She knew that the anniversary was coming up, and she thought there's no way we can let this go by. She remembered reading about it as a kid in the book by um, Lerone Bennett, they, um, um, Before the Mayflower. And so she brought it to Jake Silverstein, who is over the New York Times Magazine, and he blew it out of the water. He said, let's do this, and let's do it in conjunction with the Smithsonian. And so the components are a newspaper broadsheet that features different objects from my museum collection. And we talk about this history. And then with that is a New York Times Magazine. And so the newspaper section lays the foundation of slavery and freedom in the nation. And then the magazine speaks to the legacies of slavery. And so it's changing the narrative and moving us away from the traditional narrative to think about the founding of the nation and these key moments that speak to the development of the nation and the development of economic and political power and so much more. So I'll pull that up if anyone else has another question. I'll pull that up so you can see the components of the 1619 Project. And there is a website. Um, it's on the Pulitzer Center website where you can actually see um, there is curriculum resources and more where you can actually go through that and talk about it. And we've talked about how do we have these discussions on race and this history. I would highly recommend that you look at that Pulitzer website because there might be an opportunity. It doesn't have to be done in the classroom. You could just do it over, over cocktails with your neighbors to talk about this. Everything doesn't always have to be a formal setting. Right? And so um, that's what the 1619 project is. Let me see if I can show you the components of it. So this is the opening. And it talks about the 1619 project is a major initiative observing the 400th anniversary of the beginning of American slavery and it aims to reframe the country's history, understanding 1619 as our true founding and place and consequences of slavery and the contributions of African Americans at the center of the story we tell ourselves about who we are. Because at the end of the day, slavery developed this nation. You're talking about people who had to clear the land, um, do improvements on the land, cultivate the land, generate the profit that enabled a lot of um, things that happened in this nation, including the opportunity to do the Revolutionary War and so much more. But I recommend that you read it so that you bring to it your own thoughts on it. But it's a thought-provoking piece. And so I don't sit here to tell you how to think. I just ask that you read it and think. Yeah. 
I think there's a question over there. Hi, um, my question was just basically what made you like interested in doing this or sort of talking about topics? <laughs> so, I had this conversation at dinner with Mr. White and um, <laughs> and Mr. Potter, and I said, you know, I was doing my family history research. And I remember my aunts used to, they told me, you're the new family historian. And I was like, I don't have time for that. <laughs> and I was in the middle of trying to graduate from college. And we had our family reunions every two years. And they kept sending me these news articles. And I was like, I don't, you know, I'm a business major and I don't have time. And then I'd heard that our family was friends with Booker T. Washington. Um, and I just collected all the stuff they gave me. I put it in a drawer. And then I kept doing my family history research. And I emphasize this to everyone. Look, start with your own family. And so I, I ended up, I was practicing law with the architect of the Capitol. And uh, my uncle was dying. And he said to me, Mary, promise me that you'll keep doing this family history research. So I mentioned to him about Booker T. Washington. And he said, it's true. They were friends with Booker T. Washington. And I went to the Library of Congress. And I spent three months in the Library of Congress looking through the, um, through the Booker T. Washington manuscript collection. And I found out that one of my ancestors, my great-grandfather's brother and my great-grandfather, they were on the board of the National Negro Business League. And so what started out as a family history research project turned into a larger African-American history research project. And I found out about the Negro Business League, about Booker T. Washington, about Reconstruction, that these men were fighting to enforce their right to vote, to get paid fair wages, and that they ultimately left and went to Indian Territory. Indian Territory became Oklahoma, the state, in 1907. In 1905, they formed a delegation lobbying the White House and Congress to make it the first all-black state. My family left Mississippi. They walked out of Mississippi. They had a confrontation with the Klan. And they went on to own 300 acres of land, a bank, a theater, a hotel, a chain of department stores. They had merchandise from all over the world. They spoke with the governor of Oklahoma. They entertained um, people from the White House. and. I didn't know all of this. I didn't know that they were from Mississippi. And I found an unpublished autobiography from my great-grandfather's first cousin, who was president of Virginia State University from 1914 until the 1940s. And he's the one who wrote about there was a confrontation at this church in 1876. And these black men were marching through the streets carrying guns, banging on drums, calling other black people out to enforce their right to vote. And then there was a book written by a white gentleman from Octibaha County who wrote about the same incident. And so I'm using all of that now as part of my dissertation work for my graduate degree. But that's what I was working on. And people heard about my research. And they um, asked me to do all these projects. And so I started doing projects. And then someone called me and said, would you apply for this job at the museum, because they saw my work. And I promptly told them no. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, why not? And I had worked at a university. I was promoting their land grant units and doing their civil rights compliance for the land grant units. And I said, no, because I don't have my PhD. And they said, but we've seen your work. And I said, OK, well, I'll talk to you later. Click. <laughs> And then they called me for a week and convinced me to apply. And so I was very blessed to have this opportunity. And it's beyond me, because I've seen how powerful it's been, even from the gentleman who so kindly said you'd been to the museum, um, because I see a diversity of people go to that museum. And they don't just think about this history, they think about themselves. And so I am very blessed to be able to know that this work helps people to reflect on, well, who am I? Who are we as a nation? Who do we want to be? You know, And to see not just where we've come from, that heavy part, but also to see how we've been able to move forward in many ways um, and how we can still do that. So um, they called me and convinced me to apply. I got the job. And it's been a, a wild ride ever since. So, and then I get the good fortune of meeting you all. So that's how I came to this, whoever, who asked. Yeah, that's how, that's how I came to this. <laughs>
and it was my mother who said, you should be doing that. <laughs> yeah. So my mother financed all the jobs to Mississippi, South Carolina, Oklahoma, Virginia. So yeah. Yep. Yes, sir. I have two questions. One is about Anthony Johnson and that law that stripped him of his humanity even in death. Do you know whether or not that was ever overturned? Did they ever get their land back? No. Mm -mm. Nothing is gone. Mm -mm. It was taken from them. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, uh, I saw that it took 100 years between 1916 and 2016 for the museum. Yes. Can you talk about that journey? What took so long? So, um, a group of African American men who formerly fought for the U.S. Um, the Union Army, they um, formed a group to lobby to have a monument dedicated to African American men who served in the military for the nation. And that was in 1916. Um, in the 1920s, it picked up steam. Congress and the White House said, go forward, you can do this, but you're gonna have to raise all the money. And they weren't able to raise all of the money. And um, they formed a committee, they did all kinds of explorations about how they would do this. They even had a design. It was a very traditional design with the white columns, marble building. Um, but they weren't able to raise all of that money. By 2003, George Bush was in office and he signed into legislation the, um, the creation of the museum. But between the 1920s and you know 2003, there were many advocates in Congress um, who pushed for this, including, I believe, Mickey Leland from Texas was one of them. Um, I think, um, Definitely John Lewis from um, Georgia was one of them. I think John Conyers might have been one of them, but there were many people who advocated for it. And so we're very fortunate that George Bush um, signed it into legislation in 2003, and then President Obama was the president who cut the ribbon the day that we opened. And both presidents were there um, September 24th, 2016. So, and it's received bipartisan support. So I, I can't emphasize that enough. We've had um, very good support from both political parties who, who see this as a very valuable um, addition to telling our nation's history. Yeah, thank you for that question. stature in society, were they seen as the other um, the other people in society as someone of dignity and someone with power, or were they just seen as, oh, it's a black man who's pretending to have power? I think that varied. You have people like Paul Cuffey, who was a very successful um, shipbuilder, and he carried a lot of stature, um, but he also went to court to argue that he pays his taxes. Why can't he vote like anybody else, right? Um, you have people like Richard Allen who were respected leaders, but there was still that degree of it only goes so far. So we have a section in the exhibition called um, Limits of Freedom because we want people to know that you could be a free person of color, but there were also laws that restricted free people of color, right? So you were still seen as black, right? And you were still not supposed to reach a certain level but there were people in um, New York, I'm forgetting the family's name, that were very successful and they were philanthropists. And while they could be seen amongst black and white as having some degree of respect, they were still considered people of color, right? And there were limits to um, how they were, limits to their degree of respect, I should say that. Um, but I think it varied for individuals, but more, more often than not, it was very limited. Yeah. Everyone is going to turn on you. I mean, you want to educate these people because most 
I have a classmate whose dissertation is on, um, she looks at the relationship between African Americans and Haitian, um, people of Haitian descent who have, who have uh, migrated to the United States. And I could just tell you um, from my personal experience, I've had friends in law school who are from Sierra Leone. I have a friend who is from Uganda who actually curated what is known as the Freedom House in Virginia. It's the former slave trading site of Franklin and Armfield, Price and Birch, and others in Virginia on Duke Street. She's from Uganda, and she had to do all the research and curate that space. And she said she never knew this history. She did not understand what African Americans went through, and she had a greater appreciation for it. The young lady who I went to law school with from Sierra Leone said that um, it was not uncommon for families to show films of African Americans as prostitutes or pimps or drug dealers and be told, do not associate with them once we move to the United States. Those are, those are individual stories. I can't paint a broad stroke. I, I won't do that. Um, I think it's incumbent upon us to learn each other's story. While we can talk about learning each other's story across interracially black and white, I think within the um, black community, throughout the diaspora, we need to learn about each other's experiences. That's what I would say on that. As far as being in a room full of people who are racist and um, maybe saying things, um, I think it depends on the situation. One, I would be concerned about, is it an issue of safety, right? And then two, for me, because people ask me, well, when you were putting together this exhibition, was it hard for you? Did you cry a lot? For me, I did not cry a lot. I saw quotes that someone else read and they'd cry. For me, I'm very strong in knowing who I am, and I'm very proud about who I am. And um, if someone were to come and spew hate at me, that's their hate, it's not mine. So I'm not going to engage in a confrontation unless I see it as something that's endangering someone's well-being. Right? I might take the time to educate a person, but I'll decide whether I'm going to spend my time doing that or not. I think that the exhibition, things like the 1619 Project, is there to educate people. I can't take someone by the hand and drag them to read it or to go to the exhibition, but I hope that in some instances when we go out and speak, there are people who will come who want to come and challenge some of the things that we say so that we can engage in a conversation and maybe they'll learn something new. But in an environment where there's um, hate being spewed, um, like I said, I think for me personally, I can only answer it personally, I, I don't see myself um, being confrontational unless it's something that's endangering someone's life, mine or someone else, right? I've, I've had it, look, I'll tell you all, I've had where at age 11, I'm walking down the street and a car full of young white men yell out at me and called me a nigger. I've had where my neighbors, where we moved to a new neighborhood because we first moved to DC to Glen Echo, which was like the last frontier of integration in DC. And we, it's 1967, and we were the, basically the only black family on the block, and my sister was the only black student in the entire school. Um, when we moved to Silver Spring, our neighbors were white, they were Jewish, they were a husband who was white and the wife is black. But the child from that household called me a nigger and didn't realize that his own mother was black. I've had these experiences. I've had where people in the workplace have treated me differently. 
and said to me, well, you know, people will respond to that pretty young white woman versus you. They'll answer to her, but they won't answer to you. So it's better to put her in place. And so I've done things to combat that, but people make their choices how they combat things. I'm not going to let something stand because I don't want anyone else to have to go through what I went through. If I sit silently, then the next person is going to come along and have to deal with it. So I deal with it in different ways, um, but I'm not going to sit there and yell and fight with somebody because it's not worth my time. I hope that makes sense. I mean, you can make your own choice, but I ain't wasting my breath on it. <laughs> Y'all got a lot of questions, <laughs> but this is good. Thank you so much. Um, this was great. Um, someone said, You're, you can be good at extemporaneously speaking. I feel like I'm having an oral exam because I have this um, esteemed professor here. But this has been a pleasure. I hope I answered all of your questions to the best of my ability. But some of those questions about the contemporary aspects, I have colleagues who are really steeped in that history that can answer those questions better than I can. I know my limits with that. But um, I really appreciate the opportunity to engage in conversation with you all. So thank you. Good questions. Thank you, Mr. Delegate. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you.